Hello. In this lecture, we'll discuss concepts of calculus beginning with rates of change. Rates of change will be discussed through average rates of change over an interval. We will then transition to discussing instantaneous rates of change and introduce the notion of a difference quotient. We'll then change gears and look at graphs of functions, identifying where functions are increasing or decreasing, spotting their local maximums and minimums, and looking for concavity of graphs. Here is an example computing average velocity. A 200 mile car trip takes four hours. The distance d of t traveled after t hours is shown in the following graph with a few labeled points. What is the average velocity for the entire trip? What about the average velocity just between hours one and four? What's the average velocity between hours two and four? Well, for the average velocity, we simply compute the distance traveled divided by the time taken to travel that distance. For the entire trip, that's 200 miles over four hours for an average velocity of 50 miles per hour. However, if we look at part B and we're only looking from t equals one to t equals four, we're just gonna compute the distance at time four and take away the distance at time one. That will give us the distance between time one and four and then divide by four minus one. So 200 miles at time four minus 80 miles at time one divided by the three hours it took to go from time one to four, gives us 40 miles per hour average over that time period. Finally, just looking from t equals two to t equals four, we would compute the distance at time four, subtract the distance at time two, but now we will divide by four minus two for the total time between hours two and four. This gives us an average of 25 miles per hour over that time interval. Now in that example, the function d of t measure distance in terms of time. The rate of change of distance is called velocity. The average velocity from time a to time b is given by a quotient. We compute d of b minus d of a. This will give us the distance traveled between times a and b, and then divide by b minus a, the time between a and b. So now we have a distance divided by a time. This gives us a velocity. More generally, if you have any function f, the average rate of change from a to b is computed in the same way. f of b minus f of a gives a change in the y coordinate divided by b minus a, a change in the x coordinate. We can also call this the average rate of change over the interval from a to b. For example, let f of x equal 3x to the fourth minus 5x. Let's compute the average rate of change over the interval from negative one to four. All we have to do is compute f of four minus f of negative one over four minus negative one. We simply plug in the right endpoint to f of four and the left endpoint for f of minus one. Take that difference, then divide by the length of the interval between negative one to four computed as four minus negative one. f of four is 748 and f of negative one is eight and four minus negative one in the denominator is five. So this computes to 148. The average rate of change of this function on the given interval is 148. Now the average rate of change of a function is given by this formula right here, but we've seen this formula before. If f is graphed, then a comma f of a and b comma f of b are points on the curve. Specifically, if you plug in x equals a, you know you get out y equals f of a. Therefore, a comma f of a is on the curve, and similarly for b. So here's an example of a picture of a curve f of x. If I look at x equals a and x equals b, the height at this point is given by f of a, and the height at this point is given by f of b. Now, f of b minus f of a over b minus a is a change in y coordinate divided by change in x coordinate. That's the slope of a line, and specifically, it's the slope of the line which connects those two points. This is called a secant line to the curve. It connects two points on the curve. It may pass through other points as well. Looking at this specific secant line, for example, it appears to also intersect the curve here. The relevant point in calling it a secant line is that it goes through two points on the curve. Now the average rate of change is always computed over an interval from A to B. 
By contrast, an instantaneous rate of change is somehow computed at a single point. Your velocity at a specific time is your instantaneous rate of change at that time. Determining instantaneous rate of change is an important problem in the study of calculus. For now, we're going to use average rates of change to estimate this instantaneous rate of change. For example, consider the function f of x equals negative 2x squared plus 10x. Let's find the average rate of change over a couple of different intervals, from 3 to 3.1, from 3 to 3.01, 3 to 3.001, and finally from 3 to 3.0001. Notice that the interval is always beginning at 3 and is then getting shorter and shorter, and we're going to compute the average rate over and over again and see what happens. Then we'll use that information to estimate the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 3. So first, we just have to compute f of 3.1 minus f of 3 over 3.1 minus 3. The function f of x, negative 2x squared plus 10x, is something we can just plug numbers into in a calculator. This resolves to be negative 2.2. For part b, f of 3.01 minus f of 3 over 3.01 minus 3 would compute to negative 2.02. If we used the interval from 3 to 3.001, we would compute an average rate of change of negative 2.002. And finally, if we use an interval that is very, very short, begins at 3 and ends at 3.0001, the average rate of change on this interval is negative 2.0002. So let's look at part B. If we looked at shorter and shorter intervals, always beginning at 3, we got an average rate of change of negative 2.2, 2.02, 2.002, 2 and negative 2.0002. Based on those observations, if b is very, very close to 3, the average rate of change from 3 to b appears to be getting very, very close to negative 2. So we might estimate that the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 3 is negative 2. We've consistently notated our interval as going from a to b. What's also quite common is to fix x and a number h, then find the average rate of change between x and x plus h. This is easiest to visualize when h is positive, so x plus h really is bigger than x, and all of our pictures are going to be drawn this way. So here's a picture of a function f of x. We might mark off a specific choice of x and then another choice of x plus some distance h. So we have the point x comma f of x, and here is x plus h, f of x plus h in the y coordinate. Now we're going to compute the secant line slope, the average rate of change over this interval. So we would take the difference in the y coordinates, f of x plus h minus f of x, over the difference in the x coordinates, which is x plus h minus x. Now observe, we can simplify something down here. Specifically, the x minus x cancels out. f of x plus h is not just f of x plus f of h. It's a very common error to do that and then cancel off your f of x's, but that is not something you can generally do with a function. You cannot usually state that f of x plus h is the same thing as f of x plus f of h, so don't be tempted to do so. Also, I remarked earlier that our picture is drawn as if h is positive, so x plus h is to the right. What if x plus h was to the left. Well, then you might compute f of x minus f of x plus h because x was to the right, but then down here you would compute x minus x plus h. At the end of the day, it would simplify to exactly the same expression here. That expression is the same whether h is positive or not. So our pictures are always drawn with h being positive. It's just a convenient way to draw things, but it's not actually a required assumption h is positive or negative, at the end of the day, the average rate of change will always be given by f of x plus h minus f of x over h, whether h is positive or negative. What's important is that it's not zero because we do end up dividing by it. In any case, this fraction, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, is called the difference quotient of f of x. Now the difference quotient represents the rate of change over an interval in general as long as one of its endpoints is given by x and the other is given by x plus h. When h is very, very small, this difference quotient gives a good estimate to the instantaneous rate of change as we saw in the previous example. 
Now difference quotients are used to define something in calculus called the derivative, which is one of the main topics of calculus. Specifically, undergraduate calculus is typically divided into differential calculus and integral calculus, and differential calculus is all about derivatives, and difference quotients are very key to that definition. Let's work through some examples. Let f of x equal 3x minus 4. Let's find and simplify each of the following f of x plus h, then f of x plus h minus f of x, and finally the difference quotient f of x plus h minus f of x over h. To find f of x plus h, we're simply evaluating the function not at x at x plus h. So instead of 3 times x minus 4, we have 3 times x plus h minus 4. After distributing the 3, we have 3x plus 3h minus 4. Now let's subtract the original f of x, which is 3x minus 4. So f of x plus h minus f of x will be our expression we just computed, 3x plus 3h minus 4. Then we're going to subtract f of x, which is 3x minus 4. And the parentheses here are very important because what we see is we get a minus 3x plus 4, which cancels out the 3x minus 4 that we had in the expression f of x plus h. This is just 3h. And now we take the work from part B as the numerator of our difference quotient. f of x plus h minus f of x, we've computed to be 3h. So if we divide by h, the h's cancel and we just get three. So the difference quotient of this choice of f of x is always three, regardless of x. Let's do the same problem, but with a different function. Let f of x be two x squared plus x minus three. We're gonna begin by computing f of x plus h, then we'll subtract f of x, then we'll use that as the numerator in a difference quotient. So we're going to work just as in the previous example. We're going to compute f of x plus h by evaluating f of x, but replacing all of our x's with x plus h. This will require us to distribute x plus h squared and then multiply by two. So x plus h squared is x squared plus two x h plus h squared. Then we distribute out that two, and there are no like terms here to collect, so we're actually done. Two x squared plus four x h plus two h squared plus x plus h minus three. Now we're gonna take that and subtract the original f of x. So f of x plus h we computed above is given in red, then we're gonna subtract f of x in blue and don't forget those parentheses. Distributing the minus sign across the blue terms gives us a minus 2x squared minus x plus 3, which looks like kind of a mess, but observe we have a lot of cancellation here. The 2x squared cancels with a minus 2x squared, the plus x with a minus x, and the minus 3 with a plus 3. So in fact, f of x plus h minus f of x simplifies quite a bit to 4xh plus 2h squared plus h, and observe that everything that remains here has an h as a factor. So in part C, when we compute this difference quotient, if we stick what we just computed as the numerator and factor out that h, it can actually cancel with the h down in the denominator. The difference quotient is given by 4x plus 2h plus 1. Now in contrast to the previous example, we do still have an x and we do still have an h hanging around, which is perfectly normal. But the difference quotient for this choice of f of x simplifies down to 4x plus 2h plus 1. Now let's shift focus and talk about something else. Let f of x be a function. f is called increasing on a specific open interval from a to b. If whenever x1 and x2 are in the interval and you presume that x1 is the smaller number, so x1 is to the left, it automatically follows that f of x1 is less than f of x2. This isn't true for every function in general, but it is what we call an increasing function. A function is increasing on a specific interval if when you pick two points from that interval and you label the one that's to the left, x1, and to the right, x2, if you plug in a smaller number versus a bigger number, you get out a smaller number versus a bigger number. Smaller input, smaller output. If this holds across all choices of points in an interval, it is called increasing on that interval. In other words, the function values increase as you plug in bigger inputs. So as you move from left to right, you can identify this as a graph going up. Similarly, a function is called decreasing on an interval if when you plug in bigger numbers, x2, you get out smaller numbers. So if x2 is the bigger of the two inputs, f of x2 is the smaller of the two outputs. 
In other words, if you plug in bigger numbers, you get out smaller ones. As you move from left to right and are plugging in bigger numbers, you are getting out smaller ones. The graph is going down. Now, the intervals where a function is increasing or decreasing are relatively easy to spot on a graph for most functions. Identifying the exact intervals where increasing or decreasing happens without graphing is something that we can do using calculus, but for us, for now, we're just going to be looking at graphs of functions and spotting where is it increasing, where is it going up, and where is it decreasing, where is it going down. For example, here's the graph of g of x. I don't know what this function is, but there's the graph. Can you identify visually as you move from left to right where the function is going up and where is it going down? So on which intervals is the function increasing versus decreasing? Well, just by looking at the graph, all the way to the left up to this cutoff of x equals negative 2, the graph appears to be going up. So we would say it is increasing. Similarly, between x equals 1 and x equals 3, the graph is going up again. But between x equals minus 2 and x equals 1, the graph was going down. And then past x equals 3, the graph is going down again. Another thing that we will pull out visually from a graph are local maximums and local minimums. These are points where the function is the largest or smallest among nearby values, not necessarily looking everywhere, just close by. So here's the graph of a function. The red points are all local maximums. Now observe, this is not the highest point the function is anywhere. It is higher everywhere over here. But if I just looked close by, then the very top of this little hill is that point right there. It's not what we call a global maximum. It's not a maximum for the entire function. It is a local maximum. It's the largest value if I only look nearby to that point. So all three red points are local maximums. And these two blue points here are local minimums. If I restrict my focus to just looking at inputs close to this, the outputs I get, this is a local minimum. It's not a minimum of the function overall, but observe that this point here is not a local minimum because if I move left, I would get even lower. This point here is not a local minimum. If I move left, I would get even lower. But here, whether I move left or right, the function can only go up. So it is a local minimum. More formally, so f has a local maximum at a given choice of x equals c. If the value f of c is bigger than or equal to any f of x you would get, where x is chosen to be in some open interval around the point c. So to have a local maximum there, the function has to be increasing to the left and decreasing to the right. Specifically here, looking at this local maximum, I was increasing into this value and then decreasing away from it. So nearby, this is the highest value we see. Similarly, f of x has a local minimum at a point. If f of c is less than or equal to all possible values f of x, where x is chosen to be in an open interval around the point c. So to be at a local minimum, you have to be decreasing to the left and then be increasing to the right. Then this point here will be the smallest in its little local neighborhood. For example, the graph of g of x is shown below. Find any local maxes or local mins of the function g of x. Indicate the value of the function at these points. So just by visually inspecting the graph, the function appears to have two local maximums and one local minimum. At x equals negative 2, we appear to spot a local maximum at the point negative 2, comma 2. In other words, g of negative 2 is 2. Similarly, at x equals 3, we appear to spot a local maximum where g of 3 is equal to 4. So we found two local maximums corresponding to x equals minus 2 and x equals 3, where the corresponding values of g are 2 and 4, respectively. Now, what about a local minimum? Well, I think there's just one. At x equals 1, we find a local minimum where g of 1 is equal to minus 1. Now, concavity is a notion related again to the shape of a graph, and it's similar to increasing and decreasing, but not quite the same thing. It tells us whether a graph is, loosely speaking, bending upwards or bending downwards. So concave up means the curve is bending up. Here is a curve that is increasing and bending up. But here is a curve that is decreasing and still appears to be bending upward as we move from left to right. 
So it's not quite the same thing as increasing or decreasing. It's just a bendiness property. If it forms a cup upward, it's called concave up. You could combine the two pieces and get a nice actual little cup shape. Now each of these graphs is concave up on the indicated interval. Concave down just means the opposite. It is bending downward as you move from left to right. So here is a graph that is decreasing and concave down. Here's a graph that is increasing and concave down. Or you could do both. You could have a graph that is increasing and then decreasing, but is concave down throughout. Now each of these blue graphs is concave down on the given intervals. A point where a curve changes whether it's concave up to concave down or vice versa is called an inflection point. So for example, here is a graph of a function. Let's indicate where the graph is concave up. That is not quite the same thing as asking where is it increasing. It's asking where is it bending upwards. Then let's also indicate where it is bending downwards. And finally, indicate any inflection points, the points where it changes from concave up to concave down or from concave down to concave up. So just by looking at the graph, we're going to shade in red portions that are concave up, bending upward. So this is bending downward. If I move from left to right, I'm making a sort of bendy down thing. However, we appear to be going concave up starting about here at x equals three through x equals six. Here we get a bending upward shape, but now we're bending down again. But from about eight to 10, we're bending up and now we're bending down again. So it appears to be concave up from three to six and again from eight to 10. What about concave down? Where do I get that downward bending shape? From zero to three, from six to eight, and from 10 to 17 or so. So there are inflection points where we have a change between concave down and concave up at x equals three, at x equals six, at x equals eight, and x equals 10.